and welcome to a new edition of France in Focus. I'm Nadia Shabi and this week we're taking you for a bit of an adventure at sea as we visit Saint-Malo in Brittany, the starting point of the Route du Rhum sailing competition that celebrates its 40th anniversary with this 2018 edition. This transatlantic solo race towards the French overseas territory of Guadeloupe in the Caribbean has captured the imagination of the French. And for days before the skippers set off, massive crowds gather quayside, an estimated two million fans hoping to catch a glimpse of the men and women who take on such a daunting challenge. And we'll be talking to one of the winners of this race a little later. But first, let's take a look back at four decades of this much-loved event. One person, one boat, crossing the Atlantic. Among the most well-known transatlantic yacht races, the Route du Rhum, which began in 1978, was initially open to all types of vessels. The race's original objective was to promote rum and France's overseas territories. Every four years, the race leaves the French port of Saint-Malo for Guadeloupe. Over the decades, the Route du Rhum has attracted more and more sophisticated vessels and the world's best skippers. Among them, Mike Birch, Philippe Poupon, and the double record holder, Laurent Bourgnon as well as Florence Artaud, the first woman to win the race in 1990. Some people have the impression that the boating world is macho, but I disagree. I think it's a domain where people respect skill. The skills needed to compete in the race are not to be underestimated. In the very first Route du Rhum, the Manureva was lost at sea, with French skipper Alain Collat aboard. Eight years later, in 1986, a catamaran royal capsized in a storm, killing its skipper, Louis Caradac. Despite the risks, the race remains a centerpiece of the boating world, with a growing number of visitors and sponsors. And sometimes legendary boats make a comeback, like the Cigar Rouge or Red Cigar this year, which sailed in the world-famous race, the Vendée Globe, in 1992. Abandoned for years, the vessel has been restored by its new owner to take on the Route du Rhum. I'm so excited for the race. I can't wait to live on this boat. I've dreamt about this experience for years. Will Pattier follow in the footsteps of skipper Louis Perron, who won the last Route du Rhum after signing up last minute? We'll soon find out on the high seas. Well, to give us a first-hand perspective on this incredible adventure, I'm joined by one of France's most titled sailors, Michel Desjoyaux. Hello. Hello. Thank you for being with us. Uh, now, you won this particular race in 2002, and you've just published a, a book on the rum. Now, the French clearly lead the pack when it comes to winning this race. Is that just because there are so many more French sailors taking part, or is it also because the French have a talent for solo races? <laughs> Uh, for sure, I would keep, keep the second answer. No, <laughs> um, no what's happened is uh, when you entry in, the, in such a race uh, for the professional, you sail since a long time and you, in, you, you progress and you increase your capability to, to sail and to sail alone and to sail offshore and to manage a lot of things and lots of systems. And, uh, and solo sailing is, uh, is a specialty of French that you don't have anywhere else in the world. Uh, for example, here in Saint-Malo, You've got uh, one Swiss, one German, uh, two English, including one who is uh, living in France since uh, 15 years now. And uh, in their country, there are extraterrestrials. They are not uh, <laughs> normal sailors because they sail alone and offshore. Um, and that's an alien concept for, for anyone yeah, who isn't French. Yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's not normal to sail like that, uh, except for us French. And what's your most treasured memory of this race? The first edition, uh, there was a, an incredible battle uh, for the finish line because after more than three weeks of race uh, across the Atlantic, uh, two sailors with different kind of boat, one monohull and one multihull, and completely different course across the Atlantic, uh, finished at uh, only 98 seconds Apart? After, wow. uh, after three weeks of race. Um, and it became the legend because a small multi-hole uh, bit uh, a long uh, monohull. And um, on each edition after uh, was uh, exceptional with uh, uh, very good sailors and lots of stories. 
So it's uh, a part of our sport. Well, as you said, uh, the time it takes for skippers to cross the Atlantic has fallen from uh, 23 days, I think it was at the start, uh, to 13 days when you won in 2002. And now we're down to seven now. Seven and a half, yes. Can it go much faster than that? Yeah, for sure. Uh, we can imagine that um, in 40 years, uh, we will be, they will be, <laughs> I will not be there anymore. Uh, they will be able to cross the Atlantic in maybe three days because uh, the boat will be much lighter, much faster. Uh, the technology and the weather routing and so on uh, will uh, 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 increase uh, um, efficiency a lot. Uh, and it's uh, always like that with, uh, with humans. We always want to go faster and, and farther. But is that a good thing or does that perhaps also change the nature of this race and the experience? I think that we have to live with our... Um, our times? Times, uh, with the technology we have. Uh, if you don't want this, you can do it. Uh, for example, Loïc Perron, uh, we, who won the last race uh, with uh, a so, so, um, 30 meter uh, trimarant will race this one with uh, only 12 meter long boat, like the first uh, winner mm -hmm. in 78. And uh, it, you, you can sail without computer, without weather forecast, without GPS. You can just uh, use your, your, I don't know the name, uh, sextant. Mm -hmm. Makes sense for him, maybe, uh, not for me, uh, but why not? Uh, so it's it, no longer about winning, perhaps. It's more about actually having a different experience. Uh, it's still an adventure. Uh, in, including with all the technology we have today. In any case, the human will make the difference of, uh, of capability to, to sail, not only to race. Um, and here you've got a professional, but you've got also uh, just participants who are here just to have fun and just to take the, the same start line uh, with a big professional uh, like uh, Loïc Perron and so on. Um, but they will make the same race, they will cross the Atlantic, they will take their time and I, and I hope that they will enjoy what they do. And as you mentioned, women also have won this race. Uh, there is one woman who won this race in 90 on a big tournament, uh, Florence Artaud. She was a great sailor. Uh, and in, this, uh, in those race, offshore races, there is no separation between men and women. Uh, everybody in, is in the same uh, classification. Because it's not only a question of, uh, of uh, strengths, uh, it's a question of feeling. And uh, women are very uh, uh, well equipped uh, about that. So there is no, there is no need to, to, to make a, a difference between men and women in our sport. Thank you very much, Michel Lejoyer. We'll leave with the sound of the crowds there yeah. and the Celtic music. Thank you for having spoken to us. As we've just heard, new technologies have all but transformed the race and they're also changing things for France's 4 million boaters. This is the famous Energy Observer, the world's first hydrogen vessel. Designed and launched right here in Saint-Malo, it relies entirely on renewable energies. And while it won't be taking part in the race, its environmentally friendly tech has visitors flocking for a taste of the future of sailing. Well, let's take a look now at some of the other innovations currently being tested here in France. This inflatable Zodiac boat is outfitted with two small foils on its sides. They act almost as wings. At 30 kilometers per hour, the Zodiac seems to lift up off the water, almost as if it were flying. But beyond the visual impact, these foils are also environmentally friendly, as they're estimated to reduce gas consumption by some 30 percent. There's less resistance, so the motor works less, and you consume less gas than in a normal boat. The environment is central to many working in nautical innovation, like this team which built the Plastic Odyssey, a unique boat made from plastic waste. What can't be recycled is shredded in this machine to create gasoline to fuel the boat. Plastic is made from oil, so we do a sort of reverse chemical reaction where we turn the plastic back into oil for energy. For other nautical professionals, the future is hydrogen. Li Ten, a leading French player in developing renewable energies, has transformed the former racing catamaran Enza into the Energy Observer, the world's first hydrogen-powered boat. The vessel has also been covered with solar panels, a surface area of roughly 140 square meters. 
The boat returned to France last month after its renewable energy systems powered a 16-month voyage to 14 different countries. For all the industry's innovation, sales of more sustainable boats like those using electricity remain low in France, something experts hope will change as France forges ahead in the field of nautical innovation. And with that, it's time for this ship to sail. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned to France 24. What would a day without news be like? 2nd November, International Day to End Impunity for Crimes Against Journalists. We're here in Attendopolis, a tent city in southern Italy. Ismail's one of thousands of migrant laborers who spend the year crisscrossing the country following the crops. Some of them have been here for 15 years and they're tired of living in conditions like this. They think it's time for things to change. The Observer's Direct. Presented by Derek Thompson on France 24 and France24.com.